Romans chapter number 3. We'll begin reading in verse number 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He may be just and the justifier of Him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you again for another opportunity to come to your house, Lord. I thank you again for the opportunity to stand behind this pulpit, Lord, and uh, preach your word. Lord, I pray that you'd help your people tonight using this unworthy vessel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, in these verses, I mean, we could have started all the way back in chapter number one and then keep reading until almost the end of the book of Romans and, you know, find a whole lot of verses that go along with the thought that we have for tonight. But for sake of time, we started with verse number 23 you know I remember we started going out really you know heavily doing visitation that's what I'm looking for we used to stuff the envelopes with those John and Romans and people ask well why the book of John why the book of Romans well one factually they're some of the easiest books to understand and for somebody that's not saved you know all the begats and thous and these and Everything, it can be confusing. We know that the word spiritually discerned, and somebody without the spirit, it's not as easily discerned. But also, because in those two books, you find a lot, and, you know, comparing it to the other doctrines and everything, you got everything you need to be saved, and then some. And one of the verses that often quoted, and people refer to it in the Romans Roads, verse number 23, for all of sin comes short of the glory of God. But when it says all have sinned, sinned against what? The law of God. The law of God says what is holy and what is not holy. The law is what, you know, writer Hebrews was our schoolmaster to show us what we were. We weren't holy, right? We were sinful. And because of sin, we come short of the glory of God. Right? It's not because we are human that we are below the glory of, glory of God or short of the glory of God. We were made in the image of God, fashioned after His own image, breathed into, by the breath of life, a living soul to be companions to God, to fellowship with God. Man, in the way that man was created, was not short of the glory of God. In fact, he fellowshiped with the glory of God. Right? He was eternal as God was eternal. But sin is what caused us to fall short of the glory of God. Right? Then verse number 24, being justified freely by His grace. Yeah, we all fell short, but there's a way that we can be justified not of a great cost. It costs God everything, but we are freely justified. Right? Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth. Now see, that's the predestination part. Right, the part that the Calvinists don't rightfully divide the Word of God. What was predestined was that Christ was the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. God set forth Christ to be a propitiation. And then it was predestined that all those that received that propitiation would be conformed to the image of His only begotten Son. That those that are saved should live Christ-like. But it was set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood not in his life not in his works not in his deeds but in the holy sacrifice that was the spotless lamb of God John did not say behold the son of God who cometh to take away the sins of the world he could have but no he came as the lamb he did not say behold the one that sits upon the throne of David that takes away from the no it was the lamb without spot without blemish it was the blood that took away the sin. All the miracles that God could have done couldn't have taken away sin. The greatest miracle was that a all-loving God chose to love that which was unlovable and freely give His own life for it. But the propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness from the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. There's a lot there. 
we can't get through it all but Christ's sacrifice was to redeem that which was lost he came seeking to save that which was lost but through that sacrifice through those that accept his sacrifice and believe on him his righteousness is what is glorified when someone says I want to be saved what they're really saying is Jesus was everything that God needed and everything that God promised he was he was the son of God in fact when somebody says I need to get saved they say I have no righteousness all of sin I've come short of the glory of God I want his glory and his righteousness is what is glorified but it was his righteousness that was the remission of sins that are past because see God doesn't see things as we do you can read that verse and wrongfully come to the conclusion that Jesus died for the sins of everybody that lived before Christ no 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 there was sin singular we may commit many sins but it was sin that separated man from God when Adam and Eve sinned they didn't know it but they committed every act of sin which was what disobeying the law of God they didn't have the complete enumerated law of God like you know Moses eventually received from God in pieces they had one commandment don't eat of the tree all sin is boiled down to regardless of what somebody else says or God says I'm going to do what I want to do Amen. do not submit but instead oh, try to usurp God in your life that is sin the sin which was passed was God designed man for one thing and man decided that he didn't want it the sin in the garden was passed on to all of us we were conceived in sin the Bible tells us so when it says he took away the sin of the past what he's talking about is man's disobedience throughout all of time it started at one place in the past and he took care of it all right then okay but then part of the verse through the forbearance of God what's that that's long suffering that's mercy that's grace that's that God didn't throw Adam and Eve off into hell from the moment that they disobeyed it's that when we took our first breath after we were born in sin that he didn't just wipe us off into eternity at that point God forbore or forbears the fact that sin every day is an insult and an affront to God but he suffers that indignation to his glory because something that he created chose to rebel against God and all those that commit sin he suffers that insult so that some can come to the redeeming grace of Jesus Christ Amen. God looks at all that happens in the world but he looks at those that do it and he says but I still love you he forbears all the injury that it does he forbears all the insult and the mockery and dismissal and those who try to say Jesus never existed because he knows that some will realize that he did and believe on him and when they do his son gets glory then verse number 26 the declaration of what God did through Christ was this he declares his righteousness that Christ can be seen as just and the justifier of him which believeth everything that God did he did for one goal to redeem but that those that are redeemed they can say they didn't do it themselves there was a just one the holy one and because of his holiness he justifies others not because they earned it but because he gave everything about salvation is that God didn't have to but he did anyway and he didn't put a price tag on it and that one just can make many justified and the last part of that verse says of of him which believeth in Jesus right you can believe everything about him but unless you believe in him or on him you don't really believe he's saying true belief is when you junk everything that you once held on to and full-heartedly recognize that he's what I need 
to believe something is to recognize that it may be true or that it exists. A lot of people believe that Jesus came. The devils that are in hell at one point were in heaven and thought they know he's real. They believe that Jesus is Jesus, but they didn't believe on him. Those that believe in him say, everything out there cannot justify me, but his righteousness can. And I believe that the offer that he gave me is still good. Everything is a rejection of what man has created and instead looks to the Creator. Then, verse number 27. Where is boasting then? Who can say they had anything to do with their salvation? Nobody. They didn't design it. They weren't involved in the you know, manifestation of their salvation. All they had to do was accept something that somebody wanted to give them. The easiest thing to do is to receive. That's all the salvation is. It's paid for. It's stamped. It's got your name on it. From the beginning of time, God designed a way that you could receive it. All you have to do is accept. You can't boast in how well you opened up a present. Right? You can't boast in how great a gift somebody else you know, gave you. Well, I received it in such a glorious manner. No. It's either you received it or it goes to waste. Not receiving it is the insult. And then boasting in how well you received it deprives the one that gave it of any of their credit. A gift is only as good as the appreciation. You can invest time, you can invest effort, you can hand make something, you can buy it off the shelf, you can order it from Amazon because you forgot and then pay for the two day shipping because you don't have Prime because you don't order anything from Amazon all that often so that you can get it there on time to make them think that you put a lot of thought and effort into it. But the gift is only as good as someone understanding how much you do care about them. If they don't appreciate it, what was the point of it? Everything that you invested has no payoff. So why should we boast? Why should anybody have the opportunity to boast? When the greatest gift ever given was done so that it was the simplest, most compact and foolproof plan that has ever been conceived. You couldn't mess it up if you wanted to. Doesn't matter where you received it, how you received it, under what circumstances you received it. As long as you received it, you good. Yeah. Amen. Right, but then verse number 28. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. The law was to show us that we were not holy, but nothing about the law was involved in our salvation. We didn't have to write, you know, walk a certain way, talk a certain way, write a certain way, know this much, or have such and such committed to memory. The law is evidence of our faith. Because I am not holy and I fall short of the glory of God. That's why I needed faith. Because I couldn't do enough, but Jesus did. In fact, that's, you know, we didn't read it, and it's a little bit before this and a little bit after this. Right? Verse number 31 says, Do we then make void the law through faith? In other words, is God's judgment, which is what the law is, what God says is holy and is not holy, do we undo God's judgment by believing on Christ? Do we rob God of His holiness in saying that He is righteous and we are not? if we accept Christ. Because there were some in that day in the city of Rome that would have in these arguments. That's why he poses these questions and then gives them the biblical answer so that they could understand to go and tell those that were asking these questions. But he says, God forbid, yea, we establish the law by our faith. By accepting Christ, we accept that we were not holy. We don't undo one jot or one tittle of the Word of God by believing. In fact, we prove that it was right. Because if we didn't need to be saved, then the law was wrong. They work hand in hand. Because God does all things well. But then therefore we conclude, conclude that a man is justified by faith, which again was given to him by the Creator. 
God gave every man a measure of faith. You don't have to find your own faith in order to believe on Jesus. You don't have to go on a pilgrimage to understand what faith is in order to be saved. You don't have to... I can't remember the word for it right now. But in commit so many indulgences or give enough to where faith is given to you. You don't have to punish yourself for your sin so that God will recognize it and then give you faith. Because all throughout history... I mean, we could see it with Elijah on the day that God sent down fire from heaven. What were the prophets of Baal doing? They were cutting themselves in an attempt to merit the favor of their deity, Baal. But God said, I gave it to you before you even knew you needed it. Because I knew that you couldn't find it on your own. But then, he says, not just by faith, but without deeds. And as I read this verse, started thinking, James referred to it this way, right? Prove to me your salvation by, no, 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 I'll prove my faith by my works. Show me how your works give you salvation, because you never can. But I'll show you that my salvation's real by my works. Deeds. And as I'm reading this, I'll go back up to verse number 27. Where is boasting then? They're written boasting because no deeds were done. Right? Deeds or works, whichever way you want to define it, when you work, you get something back. You work for a paycheck. You, in biblical times, would work for a day's wages. Right? Or, I mean, we can go back. Jacob, right, worked for a wife and then didn't get the one that he wanted and then had to go back and work again for another one. Right? You work so that you receive. Okay? Faith is the exact opposite of works. We do nothing but receive it anyway. Right? But then, well, if that's the case, then is James saying that we work for something from God? No. Because James is not talking about, he's using the world's language to get across the point to the world. He's saying you do works to try and receive. What I do, I do because I already have received. You know what that's called? Service. You cannot boast in how well you serve because everything you do is for somebody else. On somebody else's terms. For somebody else's motives. All you're saying is, I believe that there's worth it that I do it with no strings attached. Servants do not get paid. Servants already belong to the master. But a worker want something from the master a servant's already been made a member of the household a worker doesn't get to stay at the master's house he leaves at the end of the day a worker can say well I went out and I harvested that crop better than anybody else that's why I deserve more pay a servant says I'd have gone out and done it for free because he's given me everything so as I was thinking along those lines and that word in verse number 27, boasting, where is boasting then? God gave me the thought, on where there's boasting, there's no blessing. Where there's boasting, there is no blessing. I mean, we can go to chapter number 4, talking about Abraham. Okay, because here is, you know, verse number, what then shall we say about Abraham our father? Some people, this was a little confusing to them, especially the Jews who believe that their lifestyle is what made them worthy of God's blessings. Now, the only reason they received blessings from God is that God gave them a promise a long time ago to a man named Abraham. And God honored that promise throughout all of history. Even today, as wicked as some of them may be, the nation will be blessed of God. And those that bless them, He'll bless too. Those that curse them, He'll curse them. Because he still honors his word. But he says, he really throws a curveball to him. He says, if Abraham was the one that you look back to, when did Abraham receive his promise from God? When he was uncircumcised. You can go and read chapter number one, all, or in chapter number four, verse number one down to verse number five. Okay? But he says, he was justified by faith. 
He believed that God was going to show him a city whose builder and maker was God. And because he believed, he just went looking for it. God imputed righteousness unto him because he just believed God. Not because he looked for it in such a manner. Not because he lived a certain lifestyle. In fact, at that point, he hadn't been circumcised yet. He had no works to glory in. Those verses go on to say that the circumcision was given as a token of his faith. His faith is what separated him from the world, and God gave him the token of circumcision to show that because I believe, I'm different than the rest of the world. It was an outward manifestation of something that had happened inwardly. And he said, well, before he was ever circumcised, God gave him the promise of blessing. So he says, explain that to me, if works is what gives you the Abrahamic blessing, as it's referred to. He says, if there's boasting in what Abraham could have done, there would have been no blessing. If Abraham merited the favor of God because of what he did, if he merited his own righteousness, then the law would have been enough to save you. In fact, all of chapter number 3 goes through those that lived a certain lifestyle outwardly, but yet they didn't apply it inwardly. And he says that they're going to be judged of God one day, and all the judgment that they meted out will be applied to them. They may have been able to escape it here, but be not deceived, God is not mocked. But if I can boast in what has been done, I rob God of everything that He designed salvation to be. Amen. Not about me. I received it, but it's all about Him. Amen. In fact, look with me again, back in verse number 26, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness. Not to declare my faith. Because of faith, I can have His righteousness imputed to me, but it's still His righteousness. The righteousness of Abraham was God's righteousness that He covered him in for a while. Because by faith, He looked on and saw that God was going to make a great nation out of him. It was still just Abraham and Sarah. But He said, God's going to do what He said. If you can boast, or if you do to boast, there will be no blessing. God is not impressed in what I can do. God's impressed in what Jesus has already done. God's not impressed in how well I can live as a Christian. He's impressed with Christ. That's why He told me to be Christ-like. God's not impressed in how well I can get up and talk in front of people. God's not impressed in, with how sociable you can be or how friendly you can be. God is impressed with give Christ the glory. So along that vein, and we've already hinted at one, we're going to look at if there's boasting, there's no blessing. Some people wonder, well, I do so much, but how come there's so little it seems like in the cupboard? How come there's so little when it comes to counting my blessings? Well, if they're being honest, start counting your blessings and uh, you've got more than you already deserve, more than you could already handle, and more than you'll already ever need for the rest of your life. Not to mention all of eternity. But if you look around and you think that, well, where's the fruit? Well, maybe it's because you labored or you worked so that you could boast. Yeah, well... There's a difference between work and service. You know what the difference is? Service has faith. Work has none. A person that goes out and labors all day on the job, you may have some faith. It may last for two weeks, or if you get paid every week, a week, or if you get paid monthly, a month. But if the pay stop, or if the paycheck stopped coming, you'd stop working. You have very little faith when it comes to work. Right? You don't have faith that if you work, eventually they'll get around to giving you what's due to you. Right now, I understand that you know sometimes, things, like if your company were to go under and they said, hey, we're getting ready to get a bailout from the government like the banks did back in 2008. Right? So we may miss a week, but it's coming. Well, you may have a little faith. But a servant has nothing but faith. They don't receive for their service. 
but they believe that the master is just going to take care of them. They don't have anything to hang a hat on except the master's word. If he asks them to do, he doesn't command them. But if they don't, they understand that they may go without. The only reason that they're a part of the house is because of the master's kindness. So they, by faith, believe that someone that was so kind to invite them into their house would have enough to provide for them once they're in the house. They do because they love. They do, as we've already said, because of appreciation for what's already happened. But their faith the entire time is still hanging upon the master and what he can do. Because they can't provide for themselves, but they believe that because the master said he would, that he will. Okay, boasting comes in many forms. It's not just look at what I did. Okay, I don't care who the preacher is. Don't care. I promise you this. right? What's in my back? That's all that's in my pockets right now. I emptied the rest of them before I sat down. But it doesn't matter what outline I brought with me. Right? It's not in the outline of how God does in service. Right, Brother Phil? I've learned this. Right? Those that believe it's in the outline or it's in the words are those that believe that because they put so much in that that's what's going to make a good message. Most of the time they're dead in the hammer. Those that have a touch of God are those that by faith say, Lord, you've given me a call and I believe that you'll equip me to do what you've called me to do. And by faith they say, I'll get in your word to find out what you have to say because my words aren't enough. By faith they say, Lord, I don't know what people need, but you do. And Lord, I don't know how to use the words to convey what you want me to say. That's why I gave the Holy Spirit. Those that have unction do everything by faith. I mean, we've... I don't know how many times you can use the example, but it still rings true of the Pharisees. They did for man's applause. You know what that is? Somebody else boasting for you. Boasting, in other words, you want to receive or you want someone to give to show how great you really are. When it comes down to it, doesn't matter what, how many times you practiced it, doesn't matter how many times you know, you've gotten up and done it before with experience, if by faith you don't get up and just say, I'm going to sing this song because what God's done for me, it reflects what's going on in here. That's what worship is. When worship can be boasted in, there's no blessing. There's no spirit. Because we hinder the spirit because the spirit just wants to say how great Jesus is in His righteousness, in His propitiation that He made for us. You guys realize that good services are not earned, but they're imputed just like Abraham's righteousness? You know what that word imputed really means? Something we could never hope to have, but God gave it to us on purpose, not by accident. He meaningfully took something that was His and gives it to another. His presence, and you know, when the Holy Spirit shows out and we say that the big preacher shows up, that's because God's presence was so thick, we don't want to mess nothing up. But that doesn't happen because somebody sang a song. If somebody gets up to sing a song because I want to be the one that sings the song that brings, you know, revival, that person ain't going to have a touch on them. Those that sing in a choir because they just want to feel a part of something, they've missed the boat. Those that pray because it was scheduled, they missed the boat. They're doing, hoping that God will give them. True service prayer for example you pray because by faith you believe God's the only one that can do and that nothing you can do or anybody else on earth can do would do it but he did promise that he hears and answered prayer you pray so that he can get more glory I don't pray for what I want I pray for God to get the glory out of the situation that's true service True service is, I come in and I don't want to be seen. 
But if by the will of God, that thing that I've been happy and rejoicing about all week, or that thought that He gave me when I was driving down the road and listening to songs and just you know having myself a time, if He wants me to get up and say it, nothing in the world will stop me from saying it. But as soon as I'm done, I don't want people to say, well, that was a great testimony. I want them to say, that's a great Savior. Amen. True service does not bring attention to the one serving. It only magnifies how great their Master is. Because if you're looking at a person, you're not looking at the Master. And if a servant draws attention away from the Master, he's a usurper. That's what got Lucifer kicked out of heaven. He tried to claim some of Jesus' rightful righteousness and attention and glory. God is not obligated. I know that the verse says where two or three are gathered together in His name, He's in the midst. But when you just show up and expect God to be there, that's a work. You expect God to honor the fact that you came out. That's not assembling in His name. That's assembling in your name. That's assembling in the name of the church on the sign. But truly assembling in His name means we put ourselves outside and leave us at the door and the only name in here is His. That's why He's in the midst. Because we reject self and by faith say, I can't help people with their problems. God's Word came because He's the one that penned it and it's God breathed. But even if they come in, me opening it up, unless it's rightfully wielded, it's sharper than a two-edged sword. I can do damage with it if I'm the one trying to do the surgery. But if by faith we say, Lord, we can't, but we've come to just worship how great you are, stand back and watch what God will do. He will be in the midst because they've left all expectation at the door and they just want to see Him do something for somebody else so that He can get glory. Not so that they talk about how great a church they have. Not so that people can come in and say, well, wow, y'all have been some of the friendliest I've ever met. But it ought to be friendly when God's around. He said, do not hinder the little children. He wasn't just friendly to the elite or those that by society standard had a right to approach them. He said, no, let them all come. He waited for those that society spat on. He went by the wayside and did for those that he knew would give God the glory for it. Those that came expecting something left empty-handed. Because if they wanted to boast in what they received, it wasn't a gift. That was just a tool to fuel their ego. True faith, true worship is saying, God, you gave me everything that I have. And in service, I just want to let everybody else know how great you've been to me. That's what that unreservedly giving back to God means. Because of all you've done, I can't expect anything else. I don't expect anything else. Because everything that you give me, I couldn't have even hoped for in my wildest dreams. But, for some odd reason, God said that He rejoices and takes pleasure in the praise of His people. Even though He's got divine beings that every day have six wings and hide their face and their feet and fly with the other two and just sing holy, holy, holy all day long around His throne. Even though He's got throngs and multitudes and legions upon legions of angels that were designed to do nothing but exalt the glory and righteousness of God, He wants to hear me say it. Amen. And out of faith, Lord... My words aren't good enough. The songs that man write aren't good enough. The words that a preacher can say aren't good enough. But by faith, if you want to hear from me, I'll give back the best that I have. You can't boast in any of that. Because he's the one that gives you the words. He's the one that gave you the reason to be happy about it. He's the one that orchestrated a time and a place in this thing called a church that you can come together and talk about how great He is. He's the one that founded the church that you're in. Everything about worship has nothing to do with man. And when people start thinking, well, it was because this happened. No, it's because God's God. And because sometimes He winks at our ignorance. 
And sometimes he forbears when some people try to rear their head up and he just squashes them like a game of whack-a-mole and then goes on to exalt his only begotten son. Because if you can boast, there's no blessing. But then also, I want you to look, if you can boast, there's no blessings in what we do outside of church. Do you go to job every day hoping to get that little employee of the day sticker on the board? Do you go just to receive the paycheck? Because God promised that He'd meet your needs. God doesn't have to use your job to meet your needs, but He chose to. So really, the blessing is not in receiving the paycheck. Because God promised that if you seek first the kingdom of heaven, all these things will be added unto you. So what is the blessing on the job? That God could have chose anyone, but He chose you for that place. That Jerusalem, that Judea, that Samaria, or the uttermost part of the world. He said, I want you to show how great my son is. When you go and hang out with family members, is it an occasion to talk about everything else in the world, or is it an occasion to show how great God's been in your life? Because if we go to the job expecting a paycheck, that's all you're going to leave with and probably a migraine too. But if you go saying, Lord, you gave this to me for a reason. You entrusted me with this family for a reason. You saw fit to arrange this in my life for a reason, so how do you get the most glory out of it? Why do you think that the Bible instructs us to do all things as unto Christ? Because we should do it to give Him the glory. And even though He may not be seen, we know that He's everywhere. But even though the world cannot see Him, we should do it as if He was in the room. Because that's how He's going to get the most glory. The things that often frustrate us the most, we don't think of them as an opportunity. We don't think of them as a situation where God can get glory. Instead, we look at them as hindrances to what we want to do. Well, why do I want to do what I want to do? Most of the time, it's to get something. It's work. Whether it's just a 10-second break so that you can you know, not pull your hair out. Brother Ray didn't get many of those. Sometimes we just want to rest. But what if through the turmoil, God can work an opportunity for His Son to get glory? Are we willing to submit? Are we following, like that song said, Lord, take my hand, need thee every day, need thy light to guide me day and night. But we can follow, but are we truly following or are we planning? Planning says, I'm here and I want to get to there. How do I do it? Following says, whatever you want. I'm with you. Following says, I'm going where the sun is so that I can do what the sun wants me to do so he can get glory. Planning says, I want to do it the shortest way, the most effective way, the way that's easiest for me. Well, his strength is made perfect in weakness. If it's easy for me, he doesn't get glory. Now, easy, I mean problem-free. I don't mean simple. Because God uses the base things to confound the wise. And I'm not saying that if you're enjoying yourself, it means that it's work. No, no, no. Through service, that's the happiest we can ever be. It's the most joyful we can ever be. But in following, we say, I don't need the map. I don't need the instructions. What do you want me to do? And then to do it. Planning says, I want to know everything ahead of time so that I can decide what I'm going to do and what I'm not going to do. Planning robs God of all the glory. Because if I could understand it and if I could make it work, I wouldn't need to follow Him. Every day in life, if I can boast in what happened that day, maybe I did it instead of letting God do it. And in doing so, I may have robbed God of the glory that He sought 
to have me give to His Son in my life. If that's the case, there won't be any blessings. I can still go back and have the blessings that He's already given me, but the spout may shut off. Because instead of doing what He desired me to do, I did what I wanted to do. I've said it, and I'll say it again. I said it in teens class on Sunday night. You can do the right thing the wrong way. You can do what God told you to do, but do it in the way that made sense to you instead of just following. Servants follow. Workers put together game plans. Well, I'm going to go harvest this field, but today I'm going to go harvest this patch, and then we're just going to work our way through because that makes the most sense to me. Well, what if God says the ripest one is all the way out in the middle of that field and you got to start there and then go over to this part of the field? Because if I was doing it, I couldn't have made the one that was all the way over there. It may have been playing at last, but if God said it's ripe, it's ripe. A servant does when it doesn't make sense. A servant does when the rest of the world says, there's no way that's going to work. Well, you'd be right if I was the one calling the shots, but I'm not. He said to do it, and I'm going to do it. So that way, when it's, I come back and you all see that there's grapes that are so big, i got to carry them with me and another guy, you have to say, well, he didn't do that. God did it. Amen. If all the boasting takes place in what we can do, why would the world be impressed with it? Because if we can do, they can do. And if they can do, they don't need Jesus. Not saying that we walk around all the time like, you know, the old timey monks and, you know, shave a bald spot in our head and say, well, everything that I have, God just gives to me. Would you mind giving me some money today? That's what old priests used to do, by the way. That's what Friar Tuck did in Robin Hood. He went around and begged people for money and then claimed that by them giving that they had been grace of God to him so that God would bless them. You know what that is? That's a work. But what I'm saying, what God gives you, enjoy it. Appreciate it. But if it makes sense how God did for you what He did, then maybe man's trying to get God's glory. If I don't step up and say, no, y'all don't understand what happened here. You see the end product. You don't know how it got here. Only God could have done what God did. Do we pray so that we can say, well, finally that burden's been lifted. Or do we pray to say, Lord, I don't care how heavy it gets, you get the most glory. Do we pray to unburden ourselves by casting our cares on Him so that we can be focused on giving Him the glory? Or do we pray hoping to receive the answer? Asking you shall receive, but why do we want to receive? For our boasting or for His glory? Because if we ask to consume upon our own lust, we ask amiss. When we ask, He gives so that He can get glory. He loves us, but if we don't love Him enough to give credit where credit's due, do we really love Him? Day in and day out, everything we whether we realize it or not, all the good in our life and all the bad in our life, as long as it wasn't sin or something that we had sown, was given by God. The Apostle Paul realized that the thorn in the flesh was there so that God could get glory, and he was fine with it. Amen. It still hurt, but God got glory because of the hurt. Blind Bartimaeus figured out that he was given blindness as a child so that Jesus could receive much glory, and he was okay with it. Never once do you find him back saying, well, for however many years, we know he was a grown man, but for however many years... I never learned how to do anything because I was blind, so I can't make a living for myself. Now, he just went around telling everybody how great Jesus was. Every new thing he learned, you know why I can learn to do this? Because Jesus gave me my sight back. I believe with all my heart, not a day went by that he didn't tell somebody, hey, one day I was just sitting by the side of the road and I heard that Jesus was coming and I yelled so loud that everybody else told me to shut up, but he heard me and he gave me my sight, but more importantly, he forgave my sin. It was imputed unto him. God purposely gave the blessings in your life to you. 
so that we could purposely give him the outward credit for it. But when I boast, the blessings will stop because he's not getting the glory for it. And when I make a mess of my life, I can say I did that. But when he sorts it all out, I can't take any credit. And let's look at Abraham one more time. Chapter number 4. Verse number 3. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Two steps. Well, three steps. God said, Abraham believed, and then God blessed his faith. Pretty simple. Can't really mess that one up. Again, God made it foolproof. It wasn't based off of what Abraham could say God was going to do for him. No, God put the plan together. God told Abraham about the plan, promised that he would fulfill it, and Abraham said, okay, I believe God can do it. Abraham wasn't involved in it at all. In fact, when Abraham did get involved with it, Ishmael was the result, and Abraham messed up. God had to send Ishmael out so that God could send Ishmael, or Isaac in. But we think of people throughout all the time. All that it is is that we get in here and find out that, well, Lord, if all I'm worried about or concerned about, if all my desire is to give you glory in my life, how's this going to take care of it? God said he'd meet our needs. Didn't say he'd explain how. But those that believe and just trust what he said, they'll receive the blessing. Because it wasn't what I did. He did it while I was concerned with the Father's business. If everything in my life is focused on this Lord, well, who's going to go and witness to this person? He'll take care of witnessing to that person if I go witness to the one that he tells me to go to. Anything. Why do you go out to pass out tracts? Why do you go out and invest in candy to be a part of trick or, or trunk or treat? Why... Do you do what you do? If it's not for Him to get the glory, then it's all in vain. I mean, Mom sings the song. Give Him the glory for what He's done in your life. Those that God deals with most harshly in the Bible are those that try to take God's rightful place on the throne of the lives of His people. Saul was blessed when he just believed that God would make him into the king that he needed to be. But when he said, well, what the man of God said, I don't like it and I disagree with it, the faith stopped. And as a result, Samuel came up, had to slay the king that he was supposed to, you know, that Saul was supposed to slay. And he said, because of your disobedience, well, what's disobedience? Not having faith that what God said was enough. When David had faith that Goliath was going to get killed, you know why? Because David had heard that Israel was God's people that God fought for Israel not the other way around everybody else in the army was thinking well Lord how's this sword going to kill that guy doesn't matter how am I going to be the one strong enough thinking the wrong way because then I get the glory for slaying the giant David said Lord all I know how to use is this sling and I'll go out and stand before him not because I've killed a lion or I've killed a bear. He said, no, no, no. God delivered them into my hand. He's saying, I wasn't stronger than the bear. I wasn't stronger than the lion. But God gave me the ability to use this sling. So instead of putting on armor, instead of taking up a sword, I'm going to go to him in the name of the Lord because that worked before. And you know what was spread throughout the land? Not how great David was, but how God had wrought a great victory. Because everybody looking at David could say, he couldn't have killed the giant. And David was fine with everybody believing that. Because he said, Lord, I didn't do it so boast in me. I did it so that the Philistines would know this was the army of the living God. Everything about it was for God's glory. But when he took Bathsheba, that was so that David in his heart could say, look at how beautiful my wife is. And we know how that turned out. Everything throughout the Bible. Faith, faith very important. I say that all the time. 
because without it, it's impossible to please Him. But the difference between work and faith is that, or I mean work and service, is that service, we don't understand how what we're doing is going to solve everything else in our life. But we do it because we believe that it's what God wants us to do. Not so that people will know who I am. I don't give you a plug nickel for anybody that starts a ministry with their name on it. Don't give you a plug nickel for somebody that puts out merchandise that's supposedly supposed to help others and they put a copyright on it, meaning it's theirs. Well, it's either God's or it's the world's. So which is it? Won't give you anything for somebody who wants to always be heard because I'd rather hear from heaven. You know how that happens? Saying, Lord, even though the world thinks it doesn't make sense, even though my flesh thinks it doesn't make sense, even though I know I don't deserve your blessings, I know that you've promised to bless me and I believe that you will, and if you're going to bless me, I want you to get the glory for it. I'll do it not for me, but for your darling son. I'll endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ so that Jesus Christ gets the glory. I won't live as a Christian so that others will think, well, that man's spiritual, or that man's holy. I'll live as a Christian so that I fade into the background and Jesus is all that others can see. Because that's what the design is. The law was to show us we don't have anything to boast in. And grace in the forbearance of God was given to man for roughly 4,000 years. And sin abounded so that one day the one that can take away sin could be glorified and that one name would be above every other name. The name of Jesus. If all that people can praise is Jordan, I'm doing it wrong. If all that I desire is to hear how good a job I did, I'm doing it wrong. If I desire it at all, then something's being left in the bottom of the tank. I'm not giving it all. You say, well, if I give all, I won't have nothing left. Well, the boy with the lunch left with 12 baskets. All I've got is a claim to be a joint heir with him. That means I own it all. Not because I did it, but because it was his and he said I could have it. The blessings stop when we stop looking at him and we start looking at people. We got a great pastor, but it's not in how much the pastor studies. God's blessed us with Sunday school teachers that love those that they're teaching about God so they put in effort to know more about God so they can teach them more about God. But it's not in their study. By faith they say, Lord, show me what they need and then show me how to tell them. By faith we say, Lord, we know that all the effort that went into these tracks in this bag, that the people that did it, it wasn't enough. We took the Word of God and Lord, we're going to go send it, but unless you are the one that plants it and waters it, it's going to fall by the wayside. I mean, most of the people that would go would go tell you, they really don't want to stop and have a conversation impromptu in the flesh, get caught off guard, and somebody start asking a whole bunch of questions. But if the goal is not to say, well, hey, my name is Brian, and you know, I hope everything was great. But if the goal is when you're done for them to say, I want to know more about Jesus. If you go for the hopes that, well, I was the one that put the track on their door. How do you know? How do you know you even put a track on that door? Most of the time, those that come, Brother Randy, aren't in the streets that he's highlighted for that week. God sends them from where God had them. But those that are faithful to do so that he can get glory, they're not working, they're serving. And they are blessed because it's not about their ego. It's about His glory. And when we're in His glory, it's always a good time.
It may be hard, but it's good. It may be rough, but by faith I believe he's got a garment for a praise or a garment for the spirit of heaviness. And it'll allow me to praise him. I don't have that garment. He has to give it to me. And by faith I believe when it will get hard, he'll dust that off and give it to me. And when it's over, I'll give it back and by faith say, Lord, if I need it again, I know that you'll keep it well. Because if it's something that I can make that I'm praising, if in my hardness I'm looking back at what I did, not enough. But if it's something that He gives me, it'll always be enough. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.